Okay. I think I'm the last one. So um, my name is Richard. I'm going to be talking about incorporating multiple stresses and decision support tools. And this is using uh, NIWA's disturbance recovery model. Um, so, uh, so disturbance is a primary driver of uh, marine ecosystem um, biodiversity um, and patterns. And one of the ways that disturbance controls these patterns is through death of individuals, um, impacts on uh, colonisation um, success, and changes to the interactions between species. And it can also change the um, sediment characteristics, so the biogeochemical processes in the sediment, um, which influences recolonisation as well. Um, so there's been a, a lot of research done on the relationship between individual species and disturbance events such as fishing, and these images just show an example of um, horse, muscle, uh, horse muscle bed before and after a uh, fishing trawl. Another uh, important driver of uh, marine ecosystem patterns is sedimentation, so um, this could be through, uh, say, um, covering of sediment, say, covering of species. Um, uh, basically catastrophic dumps of sediment and also um, changes to suspended sediment loads, so um, affecting, say, benthic light availability, um, the quality of food available for individuals, or maybe um, exceeding tolerances to individual species in terms of, say, filter feeding bivalves. Um, so Basically, what we're doing at the moment is the disturbance recovery model is based on a patch disturbance, a uh, patch dynamic model of seafloor disturbance. So if you, if you look into the image on the screen up behind me, um, that represents an intact um, marine ecosystem. Within the red box, um, that, that represents a disturbance event, say. Um, immediately following the disturbance, there's the potential for colonisation from adjacent cells. Generally, that's the um, faster growing, um, more opportunistic species, and that's uh, followed up eventually by the slower growing um, species such as emergent epifauna. Um, so then if, if we, basically the disturbance recovery model itself looks at eight interacting functional groups, which is just uh, species that are grouped based on shared uh, traits. And those include things like age and maturity, uh, mortality, uh, seasonal reproduction, um, dispersal properties, um, sediment requirements, and um, adult juvenile interactions. And um, basically there's been a, a load of work done on soft sediment ecology in New Zealand and looking at these relationships and how species respond to disturbance and recovery. And based on this, um, I think a lot of people will be familiar with the importance of, say, epifauna like sponges um, as, say, nursery habitat for fish. But there's also a lot of species that do important things below ground as well, below the sediment, such as um, burrowing um, species such as shrimp and crabs, so functional group seven in our example there. Um, so what does this disturbance recovery model actually show us at this stage? Basically, um, the graph behind me here is a um, graph of the proportional abundance of different functional groups within this model. And the, um, the time is on the x-axis. And in the pink section, there's a disturbance event. And then post-disturbance, there's a recovery um, event as well. So this represents a um, relatively low impact to the model. And basically, if we looked at um, functional group six, for instance, which is the, the orange bar there, we can see that during disturbance, the, the proportional abundance of functional group six um, drops down a wee bit, but then it pops up again after um, after this disturbance event's over. However, if we increase the disturbance um, uh, magnitude, this response is um, accentuated. And if we continue to increase it, we can actually get a complete loss of functional group six from the model. And similarly, uh, other functional groups, such as um, functional group one and two, which are the opportunistic species, actually increase through the model as well. So I'm not sure if this is going to work, the, um, the video, to play that. Basically, this is a, a bird's eye view of the model. Um, if you imagine the white cells are disturbance events, um, soon after there's uh, uh, increase in the black predators and then the yellow and green opportunistic species, and, ev and then eventually a recovery in the system. So. Um, Basically, what we're hoping to do, what we have been doing actually now, based on um, 
Tasman Golden Bays is to try and um, integrate the impacts of fishing and sedimentation into the model. So we've been adapting the model to different types of fishing um, and sensitivities to fishing gear. We've also been um, including other types of disturbance, um, including sedimentation. And we're trying to identify um, indicators and warning signs of tipping points um, in ecosystem um, and functional group abundance and proportion. So in terms of the fishing, um, we've done an extensive literature review to develop um, fishing sensitivity curves for individual functional groups. And we've also refined the spatial response to fishing within the model. So we've looked at Tasman Golden Bay fishing um, intensity data sets from, I think it's a five year data set. We've basically noticed that it's quite spatially and temporarily correlated. So we've simulated um, fishing events based on this data that are similar to what you might expect to see in Tasman Golden Bay within the model. We've also looked at um, the impact of sedimentation. So we've basically conducted uh, an extensive um, uh, trawl of, the, uh, of our macrofauna data sets and develop these relationships between functional group abundance and sedimentation. So we've used mud content and um, basically GLMs, um, uh, binned GLMs of 90th percentiles. And we've also um, looked at actual mud data from Tasman Golden Bay to try and um, modify functional group composition throughout the model. Um, so the next steps are basically to look at the combined impact of fishing and sedimentation um, and how this might affect the functional group responses. We're also um, exploring modifying the model to better represent the shape and characteristics of Tasman Golden Bay. So I'm not sure if you can play this video as well, please. Thank you. Um, and then we're meeting in December where we'll get feedback from stakeholders to refine scenarios of interest to Tasman Golden Bay community. Um, and the model basically is just showing out the steps we've sort of moved in terms of our spatial um, shape of Tasman Golden Bay and trying to integrate some of these other factors into the, into the model as well. So I just want to acknowledge um, the following and say thank you and um, well done getting through to these talks. <laughs>